afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was asked to come here today to talk about entrepreneurship. And I'm sure a lot of you are probably thinking, not another entrepreneurship talk. It's kind of a buzzword. Everybody's talking about it. And some of us have gotten sick and tired of hearing about it time and time and time again. Uh, that's actually what I was thinking when Zaid first told me that I want you to come here and talk about entrepreneurship. And in particular, about being an entrepreneur in Jordan and some of the interesting events and obstacles that you've experienced over the years. Now, when we want to talk about anything, you have to start at the very beginning. So we have entrepreneurship. Before we can talk about how we can become good entrepreneurs, we have to start with what is an entrepreneur? You know, you have this word, entrepreneurship. It's French, and it's pretty hard to spell. But is it hard to understand, or is it actually something deceivingly simple? I'm going to start with an example. Let's say I want to buy a nice car, and you have a car dealership. So if I came to you and I said, I need your advice in getting a nice car, odds are the first thing out of your mouth is going to be, what is your idea of a nice car? Because your answer depends on my answer. If I told you my idea of a nice car was a Bentley, your reply would be entirely different than if I told you my idea of a nice car is Bidikiya Sifia Tu Beba, Spoilerat Min Uddam, Spoilerat Min Wara, Wa Ham Ishi Lam Adas Al Brick, Dow Azra Wara Ashan Yamili Warai. It makes a big difference. So when we say entrepreneurship, depending on who you ask, you know, if you came and asked 10 people, how do I become a good entrepreneur, you'll get 10 different answers. And I don't think that's because there's necessarily 10 different ways of becoming a good entrepreneur, so much as it is because there's 10 different definitions floating out there as to what is an entrepreneur in the first place. Depending on who you ask, you might be told that an entrepreneur is somebody who, by the age of 18, has their own company, or at 25, has earned enough to never need to work ever again. Or maybe an entrepreneur is somebody who doesn't have to wake up before one or two in the afternoon because that's what makes them happy. And I think that's really missing the point. Sure, some entrepreneurs do fit this category, but this does not define an entrepreneur. You won't find this in the dictionary when you go to an entrepreneur, and you won't get this answer when you ask some of the big names about entrepreneurship. And in the same vein, if I were to ask about some examples of entrepreneurship, you'd get what uh, Zaid likes to call the usual suspects. Uh, people who have taken ideas that have been proven successful in the Western world and bringing them to here. You'd have an Arabic Facebook, YouTube with Arabic subtitles, uh, an eBay for Jordan. And these are good business ideas, certainly. They're sound business practices, and they're pretty much guaranteed to succeed. We've seen them and their potential uh, in the other countries. But these are not entrepreneurship, because an entrepreneur is not defined by the work that they do so much as it is where that work comes from. An entrepreneur is simply somebody that solves problems. So if you're taking a problem that somebody's already solved, and you're simply copying it or taking it to an untapped market, you're a good businessman, but you're not an entrepreneur. You're, you're reselling ideas in the same way that somebody selling Khudra from al -Ghur is a reseller. There is no true creativity happening here. And if it is there, it's in a more limited sense. Uh, there is, there's a saying in the United States and here, in an Arabi, al-haja um al-ikhtira. And in English, necessity is the mother of invention. And I'm sure you can all understand it. It's a fairly simple concept. You know, everybody understands that you know, there's a great motivation in necessity. al uh, is al-aqwa, you know, to really need something. But do we really understand how far and how true this is? To me, there can be no innovation without true need. There are a number of inventions that have happened accidentally, whether we're talking about penicillin or the x-ray or floating soap. But by and large, most true innovation comes from true necessity. And in this age of globalization, it's become increasingly rare for us to find problems that haven't already been experienced somewhere else, that haven't already been solved by somebody else at some other point of time, some other day, in some other place. And this is probably our problem as a culture. In, I'm not saying Jordan, but as a Middle East. In order to come here from Amman, you all drove your Japanese or your German cars. In order to call our friends in Irbid or Ma'an and tell them about what we're, what we're doing here, we'll use our Nokia from Finland or our iPhone from the United States or our Blackberry from Canada. And it's this culture of getting used to other people solving our problems for us that prevents us from discovering true innovation. We've forgotten what it's like to need something, to really have a challenge that needs somebody to step up and address it. And at this point, you're probably wondering, OK, fine, so you've told us what an entrepreneur isn't. You know, but what is an entrepreneur? How do you become an entrepreneur? Where do you find these ideas that need solutions? 
And I'm here to tell you that odds are each and every one of you has already taken the first step in becoming a good entrepreneur. How many of you have, at some point in time or the other, let's say you're at the mall, driving to work, in a meeting, getting your passport renewed, getting your daribe done, and you've thought to yourself, this is stupid, there has to be a better way. These seven simple, magical words, there has to be a better way, are the gateway to entrepreneurship. These are the words that open doors. These are the words that have gone through the minds of each and every single great inventor since the dawn of time. These are the words that everybody thinks, but only entrepreneurs truly appreciate. And these are the words that I can guarantee you went through the mind of Alexander Graham Bell when he invented the world's first telephone. I can practically see him in my mind's eye, tired of sending letters to his friends to invite them over for mensaf. And he thought to himself, this is stupid, there has to be a better way. And he went on to invent the telephone. And these were the words that went through the mind of Thomas Edison when he invented the world's the first light bulb. And I can see him as well complaining. And he found that better way. He made the light bulb. And for that, we are all grateful. Which brings me to another point. It's important to distinguish between recognizing the potential for a better way and knowing the answer to that. None of us are born with all the knowledge in the world. But we take it step by step. So we have to first see the potential. We have to realize, you know what, there's something wrong going on here. There has to be a better way. And then we can go on to, to find the solution to this question. In the back of the mind of every single entrepreneur, there is what I like to call a drawer labeled the idea bank. And each and every time we find ourselves thinking there has to be a better way, we write it down and we stick it there. We don't necessarily know the solution at this time, but over time, we never know what will happen. And I'd like to share with you a small example. Um, eight years ago, perhaps, I was chatting on an online forum with a friend. And he was telling me about his nephew, Bil Arabi Ibn Akhu, who was blind, Ama Barir. And in order to use a computer, he was telling me how he would have to print each and every web page that he wants to see. Now, the blind have this language called Braille, and it's basically a series of raised dots that, you know, when they move their fingers over them, they can tell what, it's, what it says. And this one here is an example of the word TEDx in Braille. And it's used by people around the world in Arabic, in English, in French, whatever you want. This is the standard solution. And so basically, this blind child would have to print each web page he wanted to read. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. I couldn't imagine living my life having to print each and every page I wanted to see. You know what I mean? I'm on a computer 24-7. If I had to do that, I would have run out of paper, I would have run out of printers, I would have run out of everything. You know, it's not feasible. But obviously, I was a kid in the eighth grade, I didn't know what the better way was. In fact, I wouldn't have recognized a better way if it danced in front of me naked. But the point is, I realized that there was a potential here. But like I said, I didn't know the solution. So I put it in the back of my head in this idea bank, and I forgot about it. And we can fast forward six or seven years. I was graduating from computer engineering at Just in Idbid, and we were asked to, have a, to make a graduation project. Some of my friends were going to make an Arabic Facebook. Some of them were going to make a robot with a webcam that could wave its hand and say hi. And some of my friends wanted to make an e-learning system. Now, none of these are particularly bad ideas, but to me, I felt that none of them addressed true needs. You know, they were good business ideas, but they weren't solutions because they weren't addressing a real problem. So what I did was I opened this, this drawer that I had in the back of my head, and I started going through some of the ideas that I'd had over the years. And I came across this problem that I had, come, that I had thought of many years ago. And I decided I'd do a bit more research, because it was something that I had uh, you know, perhaps gained experience over the past decade enough to you know, find an alternative, find that better way. And in doing my research, I discovered some truly depressing statistics. Okay. Did you guys know that around the world, over 45 million people are completely blind? That every five seconds a person loses their sight? That every one minute a child goes blind? That 90% of blind children don't receive the schooling they need? That their peers, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed the gift of sight upon have? That 87% of the world's blind live in developing nations, such as India and China and the Middle East? These, to me, 
meant that there was a problem that I needed to solve. It made me want to find that better way. And I did some more research, and it turns out that I was right. There is a better way. And it's something known as the refreshable Braille display. This is, to your fingers, what a monitor is to your eyes. It connects to the computer, and whatever your screen shows, this shows. So you open the news, and this would show the news in Braille, and it changes dynamically. You don't need to print it. You don't need to do anything. There's a catch, though. There is always a catch. This machine here that only displays a single line of text costs $15,000. So for those that can't afford it, you know, 13% of the world's blind that don't live in developing nations, it was impractical. It's a single line of text. Imagine having to read a news article, uh, an email, a line at a time, and having to wait for it to change each time. And for the 87% who aren't even that lucky, they had nothing. So I decided I would do my best to find a solution to this. And I basically spent the next couple of uh, weeks, months, I'm not really sure anymore, designing what I thought would be an, a possible solution. And you can see here, this was a CAD representation of my idea. And it was something that I was completely untested. It's just a computer drawing, and I, I thought it would be perhaps a solution that would work. So what I did was, at this time, this was my last semester in university, and I was doing two days a week courses. And I had, uh, I spent the, the other five days a week in Medina Sanaya, in the industrial city, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., from before the workers came till after they left, looking for somebody who could help me turn this idea into a reality. And I basically went from mechanic to mechanic, from workshop to workshop, min haddad la haddad, min laham la laham, asking them who could make this possible. And they basically laughed at me. Yeah, and they had a point. In Jordan, we are a country of consumers, unfortunately, and not producers. We don't have the capacity to pull this kind of stuff off. And from here, I decided that I wasn't going to give up, though. So what happened was I went back home, and I modified the design some more. A couple of weeks later, I came up with something a bit larger, a bit bulkier, a bit slower. But it was something that I felt was perhaps more possible in Jordan something that I could you know, turn into a reality. And I went back to Medina Sanaya, and I asked them again. And again, the response was, it's not going to happen. But it was around this time that I was, I was introduced to the Yamuk Design Center, which in 2001 was a million-dollar state-of-the-art lab. And we're talking about eight years later. So it was kind of out of date. But they assured me that if anybody in Jordan could do what I needed, I would find it at the Yamuk Design Center, the best of the best in Jordan. So I took my computer there, and I went, and I had a meeting with the head of the workshop, and I told him I need this, this, and this to do this, this, and this. And he was like, hey, upship, no problem. We got it. You know, this is easy. We can get this done. He didn't lie, but there was something he didn't tell me. It would take 22 hours for this machine that you see here to make a single part. And I needed 166 of these pieces. So it's easy math. You know, a day a piece, 166 pieces, I would need half of a year to finish my graduation project that was due in a month or two. This was the closest I came to giving up. I mean, I had already redesigned it twice. I had gone to the best of the best. I had used up all of my wasps. I had used up all of my connections. I had used up all of my savings, experimenting with different designs. And I wasn't, you know, I had met with a dead end. But by now, I had this fire in my chest. I did not want to be another person who would let down the thousands of blind children around the world. I did not want to be the person who would go and tell them, you know what, I'm sorry, I've given up on helping you guys being able to read. I've given up on helping you guys be able to learn. I've given up on helping you guys become the next geniuses of your age just because you have no way of accessing information in this day and age. So I, I kept at it. I told him, you know what, tell me what your machines can do, and I will design my product around your machines, not the other way around. And so he told me what their machines were capable of. He told me the limitations and the constraints, and I designed within these constraints. I played around them. I made something that was inefficient, but it was a prototype. It got the job done. It was around this time that I was introduced to a, a person in Irbid who was in a beat-down alley, literally a, you know, you wouldn't recognize it, but he had a laser CNC machine. I was told this is the only laser CNC machine in Jordan. And with his help and the help of the Yarmouk Design Center, I was able to, alhamdulillah, design a prototype for my refreshable Braille display. And this prototype would cost...
not only was I able to make this prototype in Jordan, I was able to make a prototype that would cost less than $100 to make that single line and could also be expanded to a full page of text. So it was both practical and affordable. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it worked out so well that not only did I get a near perfect mark on my graduation project, but um, a year later, and at this time I was working at Geniesoft in Amman, and you can ask some of my colleagues amongst the volunteers and audience, and they'll corroborate the story. Um, we were busy at crunch time about to release, and I get a call from the university, from the vice president of the university, and he's telling me, Mahmoud, I need you to take a couple of days off of work and come to Irbid and give a demonstration of your project. So I told him, you know, that's not gonna happen. I have a full-time job and I'm really busy and stuff. And he told me, well, here's the thing. Um, he told me that His Majesty the King wants to come to the university and see some of the projects that the students and teachers have pulled off. So I ended up going, I took two days off of work, and I went and gave a demonstration to His Majesty. And when he came and he saw that in Jordan, in Irbid of all places, not even in Amman, a student from Jordan University Science and Technology was able to put together a solution without investors, without backers, without any help from any companies or from any organizations, just because he dared to dream that it was possible. But I want you guys to know that it doesn't have to be something life-changing. Uh, in the words of the famous philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Masyid al-Firan, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Because as an entrepreneur, the same thought that crossed your mind, there has to be a better way, it crossed the minds of everybody else. Everybody else that was in the same position as you were thought the same thing. But you took the initiative and you decided to find the solution. They didn't. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for you to find the solution for them. And that is an entrepreneur. So, anyway. And to give you a small example on how silly something could be, back in 2004, I was one of the many people eager to get their hands on a, a better copy of Windows Vista, uh, Windows Longhorn, as it was known at the time. And for those of you that have used Windows Vista, you probably know how buggy it is. Well, Windows Longhorn was 100 times worse. Uh, beta testers were formatting their computers five, six, seven times a week, two, three times a day, and we were unable to, uh, it was a real pain. So I decided to write a small program, 100 lines of the worst code I've ever written in my life. That would make my life a little bit easier. It would let me install multiple copies of Windows at once. And I released it for free online, not knowing that in the first week it would be downloaded by thousands of people, that over the years I would end up starting a company to support this product and other free software that in, since 2004 to 2011, we've had over 25 million downloads. <laughs> and that we would help millions of people fix their PCs. And so this brings me full, full circle back to my original point of what is an entrepreneur? And the answer to that, as you can see, is an entrepreneur is somebody who is inspired to find solutions. An entrepreneur is, by definition, a constructive pessimist. He looks for problems, not to complain, but to find potential. He doesn't think the world's perfect. He looks for the weaknesses to make them better. So I want each and every one of you here to know that you can be an entrepreneur too. Right here, right now, I want you guys to create this idea drawer in the back of your head, this idea bank, where each and every time you, the words, there has to be a better way, cross your mind, you will write down this scenario in the back of your head so that you will remember it in the future. And that over the years, your brain will make the connections it needs to to find the solution. You'll have that aha moment where you find that something you thought of years and years earlier can be solved through a particular way. And last, but certainly not least, in fact, most importantly, I want each and every one of you to make me a solemn promise right here, right now, to me, to yourselves, to everybody in the audience, to your parents and to your children, that you will leave this world in a better place than you found it. Because that is the true definition of an entrepreneur. Thank you.